I never use my turn signal. God, there's really no way to say that without sounding like a gigantic asshole, is there? I can practically hear the hate mail pouring in as I type this. But it's true. I don't ever use my turn signal. Not anymore. It happened six months ago. I was driving down a stretch of road late in the afternoon, cursing my boss for making me work after hours. Again. The only nice thing about it, I remember thinking, is that I get to beat rush hour. I saw hardly any cars on the road that day, except for that one. I was caught off guard when it appeared behind me. It seemed like it had come out of nowhere, and I silently chided myself for being so inattentive. It was a beat up old thing. I could tell by just looking in my rear view mirror. The front license plate was missing and the windshield was cracked. The hood looked like it was being held down with duct tape. I couldn't make out the figure in the driver's seat very clearly, but it looked like a man, hidden in the shadows. I didn't pay it much mind after I noticed. I switched on my radio and was humming along to the latest pop music had to offer. My mind on everything I had to do once I reached my parents' house. They'd invited me home for the weekend, hence the long, boring drive in the middle of nowhere. I stayed on the highway for about two hours before reaching my exit. I turned on my signal out of habit and drifted to the exit ramp. That was when I noticed that the car was still behind me. It was in fact taking the same exit. I frowned as I watched it. What are the odds, I thought a silver of unease warming in my gut. At the end of the ramp, I signaled right and followed through. The car did the same. My heart began to beat faster as I took a deep, slow breath. It's probably nothing, I muttered to myself. It's not that unusual to take a few turns in the same direction. You're overreacting, again. I turned the music off as I continued down the road for a few minutes. Eventually, I reached the first of many narrow gravel roads that would eventually take me to my parents' place. I turned left and the car did the same. Okay, now you can start panicking, I thought, grabbing my phone from the passenger seat. I never used the phone when I was driving, but this was an emergency. I dialed my dad's number hoping he'd have an idea. Maybe he can meet me at the door with the shotgun. No signal. I stared at my phone for a moment in disbelief. You got to be fucking kidding me. Panic started to rise up again as I tried to dial 911. Please work, please work, please work. Again, no signal. I looked back up at the road and saw I was about to miss my next turn. Crap, I shouted slamming on my brakes and skidding on the gravel. I took the right hand turn at a speed that made me wince and didn't do anything for the rabbiting of my heart, but somehow, I didn't end up in the ditch. Neither did the car behind me. My hands were shaking as I held onto the wheel. I was about 10 minutes from home at that point. I just need to make it a few more miles, then everything will be okay. Just a little bit more and then my car started to slow down. What the? I pushed the pedal to the floor, no longer caring about the spinning out. Still, the car slowed further and further until it was crawling. Finally, it stopped. The engine switched off. No, 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 I muttered, twisting and turning the key so violently, I was surprised it didn't break in the ignition. I sat there in complete disbelief, my mouth hanging open and my breathing coming in uneven. In the rearview mirror, I saw the car flashing its headlights, once, then twice. A surge of anger and fear hit me so hard I could barely breathe. I wanted to get out, go up to the driver and scream at them for terrifying me. But I couldn't do that. What if they hurt me? Who knew who was in the driver's seat? That's when I remembered the shovel. I had a shovel in my trunk. Not for anything nefarious, I promise. I'd helped out with the community garden a few days earlier, 
and had forgotten to take it out when I got home. I can grab it, I thought to myself. I can pop the trunk, run back and get the shovel. At least then, I have a fighting chance of defending myself. Briefly, I considered just waiting in the car and locking the doors. But what if he comes and breaks the window? The engine's dead. My phone has no service. And I have nothing here to defend myself with. I'll just get the shovel and then jump back inside and lock the doors. It'll only take a few seconds. I can do this. Taking a deep, fortifying breath, I pushed the button to open the trunk at the same time as I threw the car door open. As I stepped out, so did the driver of the other vehicle. It was a male figure, tall and slim and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. Most curious of all, he was standing there facing away from me. I froze and stared at him. Get the shovel, get the shovel, get the shovel, my brain hissed. I took one hesitant step forward, the gravel crunching beneath my foot, and waiting to see what would happen. The man didn't move. I sprinted for the trunk, keeping my eye on the man. I only looked away for a second to search for the shovel. Once I had it in my hand, I slammed the trunk shut and spun around. The man was several feet closer to me. I hadn't even heard him move. Fuck, 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 fuck. I backed towards the front seat, watching him. He stayed perfectly still. As soon as I reached the front of the car, I threw myself inside and slammed the door shut. I engaged a lock and clutched a shovel next to me, squeezing my eyes shut for just a moment as I tried to get my heartbeat under control. When I opened my eyes again, I screamed. He was standing next to the door, still facing backward, but now I could see his profile. He had no discernible facial features. His entire face was a mess of blood and mauled flesh. It looked like he shoved it into a meat grinder or perhaps a wood chipper. I shoved myself away from the door, scrambling across to the passenger side. I pressed myself against the passenger side door as hard as I could, watching as he slowly turned to face me. I saw his arm shift and heard him pulling on the door handle. The lock held. He waited a moment, somehow staring me down without eyes. I choked back my screams as I watched him back. Then he started to bash his head on the door. He did it over and over, hitting the door with his face, splattering blood all over the side of my car. The noise was unbearable. Heavy thuds accompanied by wet, squelching noises as his flesh was further damaged. As I sat there, shrieking, begging for him to stop, the window cracked. It took all the courage I didn't know I possessed, but I reached out and twisted the key in the ignition once again, praying that it would start. By some miracle, the car roared to life. Still, the man wouldn't stop maiming himself against my car. I crawled back into the driver's seat, hearing the crack in the window spread as he pounded and pounded and pounded. I floored it. The wheel spun for a second on the gravel before the car lurched forward, shooting down the road like a bat out of hell. In the rearview mirror, I saw the man, facing backward once again, not moving an inch either towards his car or mine. I took the next turn, then the next, then the next until I arrived at the house. When I looked in the rearview mirror, the man was gone. All that was left was me and my bloody cracked window. My parents thought I hit a deer and got a concussion. That's why I conjured up this crazy story about the bloody backwards man. Never mind that I wouldn't have hit a deer with the side of my car. They refused to believe what I told them and threatened to check me into the hospital if I insisted on calling the police to report something that could never had happened. I didn't bother telling my friends. They'd call me crazy too. Instead, I turned to the internet. I posted on every form I could think of, searching every paranormal site I could find to see if anyone else has experienced the same thing. My search, so far, has turned up nothing. 
For weeks, I was too afraid to get back into my car. After I drove back from my parents' house, a drive that mostly consisted of hyperventilating and crying, I parked it in the garage and stuck with public transport. Eventually, I couldn't avoid driving anymore. I got back on the road, and for a month or so, things were okay. But then, one morning on my way to work, when the sun was just coming over the horizon and the road was deserted, I saw that car in my rear view mirror again. This time, I floored it immediately. I took the first exit I came to at an intense speed, then took every random turn after that. Ten minutes later, I lost him. It's happened a few times since then, always when I'm alone. So far, I've been able to outrun him every time. I drive as fast as I can. I go in random directions. I take all the turns I can manage. And I never, ever use my turn signal. So, if you ever catch me on the road, turning without indicating, my hands gripping the wheel so hard my knuckles turning white, I'm sorry. Really, I am. But I can't afford to take any chances. I don't know where he might be hiding, or what the hell he is. All I know is that I have to stay one step ahead. Because if he gets me alone again, well, I won't be getting a second chance. Somebody's gotta wear a pretty skirt. Somebody's gotta be the one to flirt. Somebody's gotta wanna hold his hand. So God made girls. The melody of the bubbly country song faded in and out of my hearing as my husband drove 90 miles an hour down the highway. Although I found the lyrics somewhat sexist, what did I know? Maybe that was why God made girls. But he also made them for another purpose. As evidenced by my looming belly, prepared to burst, just a few days before my due date too. It was funny. As we pulled up to the ER, I had a sudden moment of panic. I didn't want to have this baby. It wasn't that I didn't want a child. My husband and I had been trying for two years before I finally conceived. It wasn't that I was afraid of the pain promised in the next few hours that I could live through. It's just that I finally felt as though I'd gotten used to the feeling of being pregnant. There was something beautifully intimate about growing another little human inside of you. Now that a human was probably less than 24 hours away from being placed in my arms, I was terror stricken. But then, a few hours later, I was holding my sweet baby Nathan for the very first time, and my heart was so swollen with joy, I thought it would pull apart at the seams. Everything about him was perfect. From his pale blue eyes, to his tiny curled toes, to the shrill little pierce of his first cries. My perfect little baby. Joey and I were ecstatic to bring our little Nathan home for the first time. We had our own house that was little more than a tiny cottage just outside the edge of town. Blue with white trim. I daydreamed excitedly about Nathan taking his first steps down the cement walkway leading to the house. Joey babbled on and on about teaching him to swim in the little creek a few minutes from our backyard. We both talked endlessly about future birthdays, playdates, picnics, and adventures. Thinking back now, I can definitively say that these were the best few weeks of my life. I won't pretend that I wasn't stressed out. Having a new baby was really tough. Joey and I rarely got any sleep anymore. One of us was always out of bed, either soothing or changing Nathan, or both. I was high-strung and tense about the little things. Did Nathan's forehead feel too hot? Did his cry sound different today than usual? Why didn't he drink as much milk today as he did yesterday? As Joey went back to work, things slowly got worse and worse. I began to think that I was a terrible mom. Unable to take care of my own son, I felt as though I did nothing right by him. Every time he cried, 
It felt as though he was accusing me of my own incompetence. There was nothing in the world I loved more than my baby boy, and he hated me. Nathan hated me. It was around this time, when Nathan was about four months old, that I began having this strange nightmare. I would wake up in the middle of the night to go check on Nathan in his crib. As I approached his door, there would be a red glow coming from his room, accompanied by a quiet crackling. As I rushed into his room, I'd see his cradle up in flames. His skin would be draped over the side of the cradle, singed and smoking. Standing in front of the cradle was a grotesque, bug-like creature with spindly praying mantis legs and a sleek black body, long sweeping antennas and a set of pinchers dripping with venom. The disgusting thing would look at me, and then to my horror, it would crawl inside Nathan's skin. Once it had slipped inside my son, Nathan would turn to me. He would look utterly normal, except for the bulging black orbs where his eyes should be. And he would scuttle like a spider across the floor towards me. I'd always wake up at that point, drenched in sweat. I could swear each and every time I woke up that I saw the black creature scuttling away just out of my vision. I'd go check on Nathan, but he was never harmed or in danger. Soon, I was barely sleeping at all. Between the nightmare and Nathan's nightly crying, I could sleep one, maybe two hours max. I could feel my liveliness draining away. Joey's comforting arms around me when he slept brought no relief. If only he could see what a terrible mother I was, he would hate me too. What mother can have such nightmares about her own child? I was a bad mother. Six months in, the nightmares were growing more frequent. Before, I would get them maybe once a week. Now, it was every night. And then, one day, I noticed something. As I bounced Nathan up and down on my lap, tears in my eyes at his hollow giggles. Thinking about how disappointed he must continually be in his own mother, I looked into his eyes and realized there was nothing there. I'd always believed that humans have souls. I could almost see Joey's when I looked into his eyes. There was something so terribly human, so terribly beautiful, so terribly alive when you look at them. I could see his soul look back at mine, but Nathan, Nathan's eyes were empty. I stared into them long and hard, even as he started crying for milk. I continued to stare unable to draw my gaze from his. I wanted to see something, anything that hinted that my son was human, was living, was a product of God and his parents' love. Instead I saw nothing, emptiness, waste. Before I realized it, I'd been staring at Nathan for more than two hours. He soiled himself and had been crying nonstop. I quickly changed him and put him to bed, completely forgetting that I should feed him. I walked out of his room in a daze, ignoring his cries. My perfect little baby boy didn't have a soul. For a few days, I mused over what to do, even though I already knew what had to be done. The nightmares had began to make sense. The evil creature wearing my son's skin. My son's soulless eyes. The scuttling thing I kept seeing out of the corner of my eyes. I knew he wasn't right. I knew he was bad. Nathan was bad. So I waited until Joey went to work one morning and I filled the bath. I couldn't bear to do it with a knife. Even if Nathan was bad, even if he was evil, he was still my Nathan. And I was still his mother. His bad mother. We were both bad. Maybe I didn't have a soul either. Maybe I lost it giving birth to Nathan. Maybe we were both destined for hell. So I decided we'd go together. It didn't take long. I held Nathan under the water until his little limbs started flailing. He felt like a butterfly jerking around in my hand. Eventually, he grew still and sank to the bottom. 
My heart was ripped to shreds as I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and yanked it up my arm, opening my artery. I tried to open the other arm too, but I was losing blood fast and couldn't manage it. I wish I had left a note for Joey, but maybe it was better this way. He would know I was a bad mom, but he didn't have to know that Nathan was bad too. After a few moments, I blacked out. I woke up in the hospital bed. My left arm stitched up and my skin was a few shades lighter than it should have been, and I felt weak. I had survived, but why? I kept my eyes closed as I heard murmuring around me. I tried to make out what they were saying. A nervous breakdown brought on by postpartum depression, PPD, is fairly common, but this sort of reaction my mind began to clear, as though I'd been caught in a haze. I think in the end, crazy people are lucky. Because if you're crazy, you'll never know. And no matter what terrible things they do, they can't be blamed, can they? Because in their reality, whatever they do makes perfect sense. But at that moment, Everything jolted back into perspective and I became aware of what I had done, what I had truly done. A few months of stress, a few weeks of PPD, and a sheer moment of insanity. I had drowned Nathan. I had killed my own son. I had held him under the water of my own free will and I watched him suck it into his lungs. After I heard the doctor and Joey leave the room, I slipped out of the restraints they put on my wrist. They hadn't pulled them tight enough, probably because they thought I'd be too weak to struggle much. But I am strong enough for this one last act. So, Joey, if you're reading this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. Don't forgive me. It wouldn't be right to Nathan. I hope I suffer for this sin I've committed. I'm going now. I've already opened the window. At least this view can be the last thing that I see before I find myself in hell. Goodbye, Joey. I'm sorry. That Friday morning, as the cops filed into our office to talk with my boss, I began to feel a little betrayed by my job. I'm not good with people. Well, at least not face to face. Now, I can handle them over the phone because, hey, if the interaction goes wrong, I can always hang up, right? But when it comes to dealing with people personally, let's just say it's not my forte, which is why I worked at the dispatch office in the first place. I mostly sat by myself all day and answered the phone. What could be better than that? Until some prick had to go and ruin it. As my boss came out to talk to the officers, I noticed that one of the cops, a young one, with a handlebar mustache and an aura of frigid indifference, surveyed all of us helpless dispatchers, chained to our desks by the promise of a paycheck. I followed his gaze around my coworkers, feeling a little like a snoop as my eyes fell on each person in turn. Seated towards my left was Shannon. She was a few years younger than me, a pretty punk rock sort of girl with short hair and heavy eyeliner. She always answered the phones with an energetic kind of voice that bubbled up from some secret reserve inside her. I was a little jealous of her enthusiasm. I'd never had that in my life, if I'm being honest. Next to her was Samantha. Samantha was basically Shannon's opposite, with long blonde hair and bright blue eyes. She was good at her job but she didn't handle problem customers very well. Every time someone screamed at her over the phone, she'd devolve into tears and one of us would have to comfort her. That job usually fell to me, which is hilarious in and of itself because I am terrible with empathizing with people. Then we have Eric. If I had to pick anyone that I liked in the office, it was him. He didn't interact with people. I mean, if social protocol absolutely dictated it, then he might grunt a hello to us in the morning. 
Otherwise, he sat at his desk, answered calls, and pretended we weren't there. That suited me just fine. If I could, I'd get rid of all social interaction that wasn't absolutely necessary. Finally, seated to my right was George. He's a big, hulking sort of guy, which would be intimidating if he wasn't such a giant teddy bear. He likes to hug me when I come into work. To be honest, I don't mind it as much as I should. If he was anyone, and I mean anyone else, well, he'd be on my death list. But something about the way he laughs and his eyes sparkle, if I liked people, then I'd like him. Officer Intimidating Mustache took in each of my coworkers in turn, pausing only for a moment on me. I guess I'm not overly noticeable. I don't mind it. He paused a little when he got to Eric. I noticed and I found myself nodding almost imperceptibly. I mean, if I had to pick a murderer, that's probably who I'd choose. Oh, right, the murders. Two is a coincidence, three is a trend, four brings the cops. It was a strange case, and the cops looked a combination of awkward and bewildered as they stood there, questioning my stammering boss in the dim light of our office. See, when you're trying to catch a serial killer, you look for similarities, right? There's usually something that connects the victims. Maybe they're all young women. Maybe they're all blonde hair. Maybe they all work in the same neighborhood. Well, all the victims over the past few months had our office number in their recent calls list. I actually remember one of the victims, the fourth victim, the one that brought the cops to our door. He was a regular customer. I guess that's why they finally decided to check us out. His name was Andrew and fuck, he was a little prick. He was young, entitled, your basic millennial snot-nosed douche. He and his buddies had a habit of trashing whatever cabs we sent them, and he'd been warned several times about it. It seemed like I was always the one who got his calls too. He liked to scream, that kid. He was always shouting at me. Unfortunately for him, all it really did was bore me. My boss liked to have other dispatchers pass trouble calls to me because nothing riles me up. Perks of being me, I guess. After the cops had grilled my boss, they left. The mustache man eyeing Eric with suspicion. I don't think he even noticed. He was too busy on a call, looking exasperated. It wasn't easy to tell when he was frustrated, but if you watched closely, you'd see his eyebrow twitch. And that's when you'd know. His eyebrow was twitching furiously, and I was glad I wasn't on the other end of that call. Who knows? Maybe that unlucky caller would be the next victim. Once the cops were gone, our boss gave a little announcement. The police will probably want to question you guys within the next few days, he said, shifting awkwardly on his feet. You'll be compensated for your time, of course. He stopped short then, as though he didn't know what to say, and turned towards his office, but not before giving me an intense look. Oof. So he thought I was the murderer? Interesting. I bet I'd be called first. As soon as our boss was in the office and the door shut tight, Shannon and Samantha devolved into quiet gossip, ignoring their ringing phones in favor of hashing out who was the murderer in our midst. I sighed a little to myself, thinking that this was all just a little ridiculous. Of course, there was no murderer in our office. The police were grasping for straws. I mean, sure, maybe the calls to our company had something to do with it, but it seemed more likely to me that the culprit was a cabbie rather than a dispatcher. The cops would probably grill all the cabbies first. We'd have to wait our turn. As I was musing over this, George picked up his phone next to me. I only noticed because immediately I heard the screaming over the phone and he sighed, pinching the skin between his eyebrows in irritation, holding the phone away from his ear so he wouldn't go deaf. I could hear the man screeching expletives over the phone, so awful that I actually winced. 
I gave George a sympathetic look and he snorted a little, amused that I was offering him pity. He was about to interrupt the screamer when suddenly, the man's voice seethed over the phone and George froze. I'm going to come down there to the office and beat the shit out of you, you hear me? Oh, George heard him. Everyone in the goddamn office heard him. I saw something in George's demeanor change as soon as those words were hanging in the air. See, it was the eyes. He had these bright, expressive blue eyes, but suddenly, they were dead and flat. His face dropped, as though he had dropped some kind of mask. I'd say he looked dead, but actually, well, he looked like he had never been alive in the first place. He raised the phone back to his ear and spoke very, very quietly. So quietly that at first, I wasn't sure if he was even speaking. Sir, you're at the residence of 942 Clippingham Drive, isn't that right? You're goddamn right I am, and I ordered a cab 15 fucking minutes ago. Sir, continued George, a deceptive calm flooding his voice. I'd advise you to shut the fuck up, you lazy piece of shit. And before you think of opening your shit spewing mouth again, please remember. And then he paused and looked at me. A strange sort of smile creeping over his face, pulling back to show the glimmering whites of his teeth just a little. I know where you live. I've always had a weak heart. Not just physically. I've always been afraid of my own shadow. It was unsurprising when the doctors told me my heart murmur wasn't just a heart murmur. A year of tests. A year of therapy. Constant trips to the hospital and I was finally told that it had all been for nothing. My poor weak heart wouldn't last till Christmas. It's a strange thing being told that you're dying. I didn't come to terms with it at first. I drank and I spent my money. I did reckless, stupid things because I was so damn scared. Then I got the news that a young woman called Laura had been declared brain dead and that I, the lucky chosen one, would be getting a brand new heart a week later. I drove to the hospital slowly, carefully, and readied myself for the ordeal that was to come. As I was laying in bed on the last night, the thought of Laura swirled around in my head and it wouldn't leave me alone. It was like her name was in flashing lights every time I closed my eyes. It was wrong. I know it was, but I had to see the woman who was giving me her heart. It didn't feel right not to put a face to the one who was saving my life. I knew her name. I knew what ward she was staying on. I had overheard the two nurses discussing it. I wandered down the meandering hallways until I found what I was looking for. Taking my time, making sure I didn't miss any name. I guess I had the time on my hands now. In the second to last room, she lay in bed. A woman sat on the bed next to her, holding her hand, and my own weak heart stuttered. Excuse me? I had no idea what to say to her. I'm Jenna. I'm the person. I'm having surgery tomorrow, and... What I assumed was Laura's mother stood up, and I could tell from the look in her eye that she knew who I was. Thank you for visiting. I know it's strange but a part of her is going to be living on in you. I wanted to meet you. I stood there, helpless and lost for words. Laura's mother beckoned me over. Please, she said. Don't feel uncomfortable. It's what she would have wanted. I sat on the chair next to Laura. How did she? I broke off. It was too awful to ask. Laura's mother gave me a thin smile. She was a care worker, looking after battered wives, abused women. Last month, she met a guy and, well, I suppose years of training can't help you when you're in love. She ignored the warning signs, and he killed her. She dedicated her life to those who needed her. Laura's mother looked down. I don't know why I did it, but I reached over and held Laura's hand. I'm so sorry. 
I had a boyfriend once who, he was like that too. Someone like Laura convinced me to leave. Laura's mother gave me another half smile. I could see the tears in her eyes. Then Laura squeezed my hand, tightly. She gripped me so hard her fingernails dug into my skin. I recoiled. A look of horror on my face. Laura's mother looked at me calmly. She squeezes my hand sometimes as well. I think the doctors call it muscle spasms. Either way, there's none of Laura left in there anymore. I looked at the small crescent moons that had just started to bleed on the palm of my hand. The surgery went perfectly. I was wheeled to the recovery suite after it was over and done with. The raised wound on my chest, covered by gauze. It was better if I didn't see it, I thought. I didn't need any more heart issues. I spent the first day doped up on pain medication, eating only a little and sitting up maybe two times. It was a long process, they reassured me. Laura's mother came to visit me the day before I was due to leave. Her calm demeanor wasn't waved, but I could see that she was suffering. She looked 10 years older, and her hand shook when she gave me a hug. When are you going home? Tomorrow, I told her. Please, come visit me whenever you want. I started to jot down my address for her. When out of the corner of my eye, a flash of blonde disappeared through the doorway. The same brilliant blonde as Laura's hair. Ow! I cried out suddenly. It felt like someone had sharply squeezed my hand so hard it almost crushed the bones. Laura's mother rushed to my side, a look of concern in her eyes. What's wrong? Is it your heart? She stumbled over the last words coming to terms with what she had said. I tried to reassure her and said I'd let the doctors know, and she left with a look of worry on her face. When I looked down, a new set of crescent fingernail marks were below the ones that Laura had made. Ten identical bleeding smiles. The taxi ride home was short, and before I knew it, I was back in my own flat. It felt strange to try and slot back into where I had left off. My life had been almost over the last time I had been here. I looked over the mess in the cardboard boxes. The remnants of one night where I had tearfully tried to pack and store my belongings so my parents wouldn't have to do it when I died. Laura's heart beat so strongly, it felt like it would come out of my chest. It did this all the time and I realized this is what a healthy heart must feel like. So why couldn't I shake my feeling of unease? That night, I had a dream. Laura was in her hospital bed, but her mother was gone. I could hear my heart, Laura's heart, beating in my eardrum so loudly it was painful. I tried to cover them, but my hands were pinned to my sides. Some unexplainable force was moving me towards the motionless figure of Laura on the bed. Her lips were blue and the window had come open, whipping her blonde hair around her face. I was almost on top of her when her eyes flew open. They were milky white, the eyes of someone dead. Get out, she rasped, her voice guttural. I could hear the heartbeat faster and faster drumming until I thought I couldn't take it anymore. Then I woke up. The sound had been real. Laura's heart was so loud it felt like it would rupture my eardrums and I screamed in agony, trying to cover my ears. It was useless. It was coming from some deep place inside me. I could feel it reverberating around the hollows of my chest. I stumbled out of bed, gasping for air, and tried to find my phone. I needed to call someone, anyone, an ambulance or my mom, anyone that would pick up. Get out. It was a faint whisper over the hammering thumps of Laura's heart, a low guttural voice that sounded like it had been made by an animal, and I crawled to the door, down the hallway, choking on my screams for help. My neighbor opened the door his eyes as wide as saucers at the sight of me on the floor clutching my chest. 
He drove me to the hospital as I cried in the passenger seat of his car. After about 50 different checkups, the doctor told me that absolutely nothing was wrong with me. They told me my heart was regular, my blood pressure was normal, and that everything was going just swimmingly. I stood in the waiting area, wallowing in my shame and frustration. That heart didn't belong to me. My phone buzzed on the counter, an unknown number. Great. That was all I needed. More unexplained, scary things like a stranger on the end of the phone. My voice sounded small on the line. Hello? Good morning. This is the Tame Valley Police. We've called to report an incident that occurred in your flat at around 1.30am today. I felt a wave of embarrassment. I'm so sorry. I recently had surgery and I wasn't feeling well. I had to have my neighbor drive me to the hospital and I think I panicked a little in the hallway before I left. There was a small silence on the other end of the phone. I'm afraid this is something you might want to be sitting down for. I felt Laura's heart beats, strong and calm. There was an incident of forced entry by Samuel Matthews. According to the police records, he's your ex-partner and you filed a restraining order against him in September 2017. My blood ran cold. I did. He's in police custody. We found an automatic weapon on him and we believe he had the intention to harm you. We have an officer currently stationed at your flat who can fill you in depending how long your hospital stay will be. I thanked him and hung up the phone. For a moment, I leaned against the wall, the horror slowly spreading over me. If I had been in my flat 10 minutes later, he would have found me. Laura's heartbeats filled my ears again, but now they were gentle, calming. Her mother said she dedicated every part of her to helping those who needed it. I put both hands on my chest, overwhelmed by my own gratitude, and listened to Laura. I did one of those at-home DNA testing kits. You know the ones they can supposedly tell your ancestral makeup? help you connect with long lost relatives, that sort of thing. The specific test that I used had this option to make your DNA available to law enforcement. That way, if there was a partial DNA match to a crime scene or a victim, my DNA may help the law enforcement identify the perpetrator. Maybe I shouldn't have opted in. The thing is, I've read about these a lot in the news. If you're a true crime fan, you know that these kids can sometimes lead police to catch decades old serial killers and rapists that have long eluded capture. My thinking was that if one of my family members is actually a monster, well, I would want them behind bars, regardless of who it is. So I opted in, but never really considered the possibility that there'd be a match. And then there was. I was contacted by my local police department and notified that my DNA had been a partial match to a Jane Doe and that they'd like my help in identifying her. That was honestly not what I was expecting. I was a match for a dead woman. The police explained to me that our DNA profiles indicated we may have been related and that they wanted to know if I had any relatives who had gone missing or hadn't been heard of for the past five years. Five years? Yes, because they've determined her time of death was about five years ago based on the state of her body when it was found. They have reason to believe it's a homicide, although they weren't able to tell me the cause of death. Apparently, due to the state of her remains, it was impossible to tell. Well, I didn't know of any family members who've gone missing but I don't know my extended family all that well. I decided to get my mother involved, who does genealogy. She worked with the police, going through our family tree, but ultimately, we couldn't find anyone. So, someone we didn't know we were related to, possibly? At this point, we decided to talk to the rest of my family, 
immediate and extended to see if anyone else knew anything. Most of our family members thought it was pretty cool and wanted to see the mystery solved. Though, a few were angry at me for giving my DNA to law enforcement in the first place. The police showed us a sketch of what they think the woman would have looked like, and my mother and I agreed she had some resemblance to my Aunt Linda, particularly in the strong brow and high cheekbones. The police decided to ask Aunt Linda and her two children, Ethan and Bex, to submit DNA samples. They agreed. It took about two weeks to hear back from the police after their samples had been submitted. They probably weren't at the top of the priority list for the crime lab. But when they did get their results back, they asked Bex and Aunt Linda specifically to come down to this station. Bex actually asked me to come with her. She and I were really close growing up. Basically best friends. We've lost touch over the years, but I still consider her a close friend. I agreed to go in with her, even though I wasn't sure why she wanted me there. When the police told us what they found, to say I was shocked is an understatement. The DNA for Jane Doe was an exact match to Bex. Of course, my initial thought was that there had to be some kind of mistake. I asked what the likelihood is that the DNA matched Bex without actually coming from her. 1 in 5.4 billion, they said. They told us that this was extremely perplexing and that they had no explanation for the match. I asked Aunt Linda if Bex had an identical twin that nobody knew about. Maybe, but she shook her head. The police told us that identical twins don't actually have perfectly identical DNA anyway, so that couldn't explain the match. I was perturbed. I'm sure you can imagine why. Bex and Aunt Linda, though, were not. They laughed. Actually laughed. When the police presented them their evidence and shrugged it off. Isn't that just the weirdest thing? Said Aunt Linda. They were both smiling and giggling the rest of the time, which clearly made the police uncomfortable. They told the police that they hoped Jane Doe could be identified one day, but that they were pretty sure that they couldn't help any further and then they left the police station. I followed after them in a daze, confused both by what the police had told us and by Bex and Aunt Linda's behavior. On the way home, I asked Bex if it truly didn't bother her. She said, Come on, Veronica, there's obviously been some mistake. It's just not possible for my DNA to match exactly with a dead woman's. The cops screwed something up and they'll probably figure it out in a few days and call us and apologize. Don't worry so much about it. I tried to take her advice. My mom even agreed with her, saying it had to be some sort of error and that it would get cleared up sooner or later. Three days after we spoke to the police, Bex, Ethan, and Aunt Linda vanished. My mom had gone over to their place to borrow some family photo albums from Aunt Linda to discover that the front door was unlocked and open. Nobody was inside. We tried to reach them on their cell phones, but were informed that their numbers had all been disconnected. Nothing was missing from the house. They didn't take any personal belongings. Their cars were in the garage. It was like they just vanished, and they didn't come back. We reported them missing, of course. And a few days after that, the police asked my mom and me to come down to the station. That's when they revealed that they ran Aunt Linda and Ethan's DNA through their database and came up with two more exact matches. To a Jane and a Jane Doe, whose bodies were found within 50 miles of each other and the original Jane Doe. All of them died about five years ago. Once is a mistake, or maybe a weird, freakish coincidence. But three times? The police were baffled. They asked us for all the information we could give them on my aunt's family. They specifically wanted to know what they were doing five years ago. All we could tell them is that they'd gone on a family vacation that year, and had been gone a week longer than they planned. But otherwise, we had nothing useful. 
It's been a few months since then. The police had no answers for us, and we have no answers for them. I keep waiting for Bex to call or show up, or any of them, really. But it's like they vanished off the face of the earth. The worst part is, there's nothing I can do. I've done so much research to try to find something that can explain what's going on, but I can't come up with a theory that makes sense. Nothing grounded in reality, anyway. All I wanted to know is if I'm part Irish, and instead, I ended up discovering that my family isn't all what it seems. When my sister died, I came into possession of her Facebook account. That looks a bit weird now that I've typed that out. To be honest, I'm probably not the first person who should have access to her account. Logically, that honor should go to her husband, Ted, if it goes to anyone at all. The thing is, nobody knows that I have access to the account. She gave me her password, Jesus, six years ago. She had asked me to log in and check something for her on my computer. I can't remember why now. It's one of those little memories that seemed unimportant at the time, but I miss dreadfully now. A million little interactions and words and smiles between us, and I'll never remember most of them. I digress. Anyway, the password. About a week after she died, I tried the password on a whim. I figured she must have changed it at some point within the last six years. But to my surprise, I was granted access right away. Honestly, Annalise, she never was very good with cybersecurity. I know I shouldn't have gone into her account. I get that, really. Even if she's dead, it's an invasion of privacy. Not just for her, but for everyone else. But I had just lost one of the most beloved people in my life, and I was grieving. It seemed okay at the time. It seemed justified. And besides, it's not like anyone had to know. I set her status to offline, so nobody would see that I'd logged in. I spent many sleepless nights looking through her Facebook. At the group she was part of. At the pages she liked. At the photos she posted. It quickly became an unhealthy addiction. Not that I cared. I was desperate for some kind of connection with her. Anything at all. And so much of her life was cataloged online. It was the perfect poison. To my great shame, I eventually began to go through her inbox. If it makes it any better, I know it doesn't. There wasn't anything groundbreaking or terrible in her messages. Annalise preferred talking to people in person as opposed to over text. Most of it was pretty mundane. Sharing pictures of her little ankle biter dog with our cousin Sam. Ironing out details to a party invite with a group of college friends. Planning a last minute trip to see her best friend, Frida. The last one hurt a little to read. They were set to meet up just a few days after Annalise's accident. Their messages were tense and curt, as though they've gotten into a fight. Frida had seemed so distressed at the funeral, crying that Annalise would never forgive her. It must have been hard. Her best friend dying without making up for whatever stupid argument they were having. I imagine that stays with a person forever. It's funny how we always think we have time. The day of the accident, I was actually at the pharmacy picking up iron pills for my sister at her request. Her anemia was back and her arms had been bruising up like crazy. She had been a little blue lately, so I was looking at the candy aisle, thinking maybe I'd bring her some Canberry eggs to cheer her up. They were always her favorite, and I used to give her all the ones out of my Easter basket when I got the call. My sister. My stupid, clumsy, lovely sister. It wouldn't be the first time she fell down the stairs. That had happened to her a lot as kids. But it was her last because this time, she was unlucky. This time, she broke her neck at the bottom. She died instantly. The memory of that awful moment, standing in the pharmacy, 
my mouth hanging open in a scream that seemed to have died somewhere deep inside my chest flashed vividly in my brain and my face crumbled as I sat there, reading Farida's message over and over. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. I was still crying, curled up in my computer chair in a fetal position when Annalise received a new message. It wasn't rare for people to send new messages to Annalise's Facebook page. Most of it was clearly sent in a state of grief, people wishing she hadn't gone wishing they had more time. I didn't read any of these messages. To be honest, that felt like too much of an invasion. Plus, they just reminded me of the fact that she wasn't coming home. And, weirdly enough, that was what I was trying to avoid by scouring her Facebook all the time. But something was different about this one. This one was from Ted. Before I could close out of the window, I read the first line, why did things have to be that way? Visions of Ted flashed in my mind from the funeral. How pale he'd been, how shaky, like he was dying under his grief, like he had no one to share it with, although we all tried. Ignoring that little voice of my conscience, I kept reading, why did things have to be that way? It didn't have to happen like that. You have nobody to blame but yourself, and I'm so, so angry with you. We could have worked things out. We could have made it work. I love you. Even in our worst moments, you knew that. How could you not? I did everything for you. Gave everything for you. You were so ungrateful. You know I didn't mean it. I just got so angry. You do that to me, you know? You make me angry, and it hurt me, too, to do that. You have no idea how fucking bad I felt about it the next day. And besides, that flight nearly broke my hand. You aren't the only one that came out hurt. I wish you'd listened. I wish you hadn't tried to run. You thought I wouldn't find out about your plans with Farida? You thought you'd be safe with her? What a fucking joke. You knew you were safe with me. I just lose my temper sometimes. Who doesn't? You're supposed to love me, and that means loving everything about me. Or were those marriage vows a lie? It's your fault. It's your fault for leaving your phone open so I could read those messages. It's your fault for hurting me when you knew I was already in pain. It's your fault for making me so angry that I did something to hurt you again. Don't you understand? It's your fault. And now you've been punished for it. As I read the messages, I became increasingly ill. Slowly, a picture started to form in my mind. A picture that made my heart rate pick up and my jaw hang open. No. No. Before I had time to react further, another message came in. What the fuck? Who's reading this? Shit. I'd forgotten that by clicking on the message, it sent a red message notification. In panic, I shut my computer, backing away from it like it was toxic. It took me a few hours to process what I'd seen, to try and understand it, but by the time I did, by the time I realized what Ted had done to my sister, I knew what I had to do. I took screenshots of the conversation and went down to the police station. It was about 3 in the morning, and they were surprised to see me, of course. But they were very interested in what I brought in. They started the search for Ted immediately. Unsurprisingly, he wasn't in their home. He was gone, along with his wallet and all his personal identification. They stopped to talk to Frida too, and she told them everything about how they'd been planning to get her away from him to hide her until she could get a divorce finalized. Frida wanted to talk to me, but I refused. I have nothing to say to her for not coming forward earlier. The police think their prospects of catching him are pretty good. He'll almost certainly have to use a credit or debit card along the way, which will help them pinpoint his location. As for me, I'm hoping they don't find him, because if they find him, 
then he'll be at the mercy of the law. And I've decided that the law is pretty lenient, especially in these parts. If Ted gets convicted, and that's a big if, he might get life in prison. And life in prison is too good for scum like him. The police have started their search. Well, I've started one of my own, and I'm not stopping until I find him and get justice for Annalise, for my family. I won't stop until he's choking on his own rotten blood. The entrance was big enough to crawl through. Crouched down in the dried up riverbed, my brother Kai peered inside. I watched from up on the edge of the riverbank. Kai reached into the saddlebag, pulled out a flashlight, and beamed a light into the cave. This was our yearly tradition. Find an unexplored cave and explore it. Not the safest hobby, but it worked for us. I just enjoyed spending time with Kai. He's the kind of guy you turn to when life turns to shit. Calm, measured, focused. He cared about people, no matter the risk. Finally, Kai looked up at me and grinned. He raised his arm and gave a smooth thumbs up. I nodded and made my way down the river bank. It was steeper than it looked. The sun moved behind the mountain summit and shadow crept over all. It was quiet out here in the La Salle Mountains of Utah. Quiet and peaceful. Like the first day of summer back in, my foot slipped. I tumbled over backward and slammed against the hard packed dirt. Before I knew what happened, Kai stepped over me and extended his hand. You okay? He said, looking down with concern. Yeah. I took his hand and he pulled me up. Dust plumes kicked up from behind me. It's about 50 feet to the chamber, said Kai, turning back towards the cave entrance. Chamber? Yup. He pulled out his bright orange hard hat from the saddlebag and put it on. I did the same. This was gonna be a crawler. Stomach flat against the ground, while the ceiling scraped against your back. Like army crawling under an endless sagging bed. Kai went in, and I followed. Back then, this was like meditation. Focus on moving forward, one pull at a time. Don't think about the rock above. Don't think about the fact you might get stuck. Just breathe. Breathe. And move forward. We reached the chamber after about 20 laborious minutes. Holy fuck. Kai's voice echoed like a gymnasium. I pushed up from the tunnel and took it all in. Holy fuck was right. The chamber was big enough to fit a 737 inside. Twisting pillars of rock and stalactites up to 5 feet long. We didn't say anything. We just looked at each other and that was enough. This was incredible. We spent a good 3 hours exploring every little nook and cranny of the chamber. No more tunnels. We should head back, I said, turning for the exit. Kai shrugged and followed after. I reached the tunnel, hunched down, and... Wait, said Kai. I looked back over my shoulder. Kai's back was turned to me. He looked off into the chamber. The flashlight on his helmet, cutting through pitch dark. What? I asked. No response. I pushed up to my feet and walked over. When I reached his side, I finally saw what Kai saw. Tucked behind a fallen boulder. Another passage. Even smaller than the main entrance. Kai stepped over and squatted down. The light from his helmet beamed inside. Ear dripper, he said. The word hit me like a bad smell. Ear dripper was a loving nickname for water filled tunnels. Imagine crawling through a storm drain with mere inches of breathing space. We call them ear drippers because your ears get filled with stagnant cave water 
when you turn your head to avoid getting a mouthful of stagnant cave water. Let's come back with water gear, I said. Kai flicked his hand, swatting my idea down. About 60 feet away, he said, there's another chamber. He looked back up at me. That familiar grin on his face and that familiar spark in his eyes. Like Indiana Jones hunting for treasure. What if it rains? I said. Forecast is dry for weeks, he said, turning back to the passage and crawling forward. I shook my head and followed after. When Kai's not worried, I'm not worried. I'd follow Kai if you went to hell. Back when we were kids, one of the ballery boys pushed me into a rushing torrent. My head smashed against a rock and I blacked out. When I woke up five minutes later, I was on the shoreline and Kai was pumping my chest. He jumped in after me and pulled me out. When I asked him why he risked his life, he shrugged, shaking his head as if to say, beats me. That was Kai summed up. I could handle tight spaces. Water on the other hand, not so much. It always felt like something was hiding underneath the surface, waiting for me. Like some ancient evil lurked there since time began waiting for me to crawl by just so he could finally clamp his rotting teeth into my screaming jugular. Perhaps watching the descent while high on acid wasn't the wisest decision. Regardless, I crawled after him, turning my head. I sealed my mouth shut as lukewarm cave water lapped up against my face, like slithering tongues. My helmet scraped against the pockmarked limestone above as murky water rippled below. There was only about five to six inches of space between the water and the ceiling here. We crept forward bit by bit, both of us twisting and pulling through the ever smaller tunnel. 60 feet away, I said bitterly, 20 minutes had gone by with no chamber in sight. Give or take, said Kai, chipper as ever. I sighed and squeezed through another slippery crevice. Wait, said Kai, holding still. I stopped moving. What? He looked back at me with question in his face, my light reflecting in his eyes. Silence. What? I said. He pulled something out of the water, slimy and dripping. The object in his hand was about the size of a shoe. I think it's a shoe, he said, pressing his upper back against the rock wall and twisting to the side. He yanked his free arm up from the water and clawed the muck away from the object. A tedious process. Sure enough, it was a shoe. An old-timey leather work boot. We sat there in silence for about five seconds until, Huh? said Kai, unceremoniously dropping it back into the water and pressing onward. What? I said, not moving. It's a shoe, he said, not looking back. Yes, but maybe it's the first time somebody lost a shoe, he said, pulling through another crevice. I shook my head and followed after. When Kai's not worried, I'm not worried. Five minutes of laborious crawling went by until, fuck, said Kai. This time, I saw what he saw. A dead end, sort of. A wall of limestone cut down into the water. Carved into the wall was a hole about the size of a dinner plate. Through the hole on the other side was more tunnel. I think it runs through, said Kai, shutting his eyes, taking a deep breath, placing his hands flat up against the ceiling and, wait, I called out. He slipped beneath the water. Fuck. Now it was only me and the sound of bubbling murk. Ten long seconds went by until he finally came up on the other side. I exhaled relief. It's not bad, said Kai calling back through the hole, grinning wide and squinting as my light shone into the bloodshot eyes. I looked at him, uncertainty filling my face. 
It's okay, man, he said. Take your time. He looked back over his shoulder. I think we're almost there, for real now. I breathed in slow, exhaled, breathing in again, shut my eyes and... Wait, said Kai. His voice sounded different, worried. I peered back through the hole, the back of Kai's head, wet and dirt stained. Flashlight beam catching the scuff marks on his bright orange hard hat. What's up? I said. Are you hurt? Said Kai. But he wasn't talking to me. He was talking to somebody else. And he sounded scared. Only once in my life did I ever hear Kai sound scared. Back in our childhood, mom was in a bad accident. I sat at the kitchen table mid-homework while Kai talked with the hospital over the phone. Is she hurt? Asked Kai. I never forgot the way his voice shook. And now, for the first time in 16 years, I heard it again. I heard his voice shaking. Kai, what's going on? I said. A long silence followed. Up ahead, he spoke in hushed tones. Somebody's here. My stomach churned like knots. Silence. Nothing but the drip, drip, drip of water. Are you hurt? Kai asked them again. Another long silence and then, Help me. A voice from the darkness replied. Small and weak. Please, help me. They sounded on the verge of tears, but underneath the sadness, Something else lurked, a building tone of anticipation, almost excitement, like they were about to pull a joke on us, a horrific, unspeakable joke. Kai? I whispered. Are you okay? Kai asked the stranger. More silence followed. No, said the voice, oddly calm now. I couldn't think. I couldn't breathe. Kai, let's go, I hissed, looking back over my shoulder. Nothing but wet darkness, like mangled throat. We'd gone farther than I thought. The tunnel stretched on forever. When I turned back, Kai was gone. Kai? Silence. Fuck. I took in a slow, deep breath and... A deep rumble echoed from behind. Thunder. Fuck. 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 I peered out of the hole into the dark ahead. Kai? I said, louder now. From a crack in the ceiling, a thin sheet of water ran down the walls. The surface was rising. Rainstorm. Kai! I yelled. Still nothing. Kai! I screamed his name until my throat bled. Nothing replied but the sound of rising water. The metallic taste of blood on my tongue. I took another deep breath, shut my eyes, and I stopped. If I went ahead, if I tried to save him, I'd never leave the cave. I knew it. Deep down, I knew it. At least, that's what I tell myself to justify leaving him behind. It took me two hours of crawling, grasping for breath and pulling myself through the bitter cold to finally escape. When I scrambled out of the cave, it was night. Rushing torrent poured down through the once dried riverbed. The thunder stopped, but the rain didn't. A vicious downpour, unlike anything I'd ever seen. Staggering my way back down the mountain, I finally reached Kai's four-wheel jeep. No cell phones back then, so I drove. Pedal to the floor all the way to the nearest gas station. I screeched to a stop in the parking lot and leapt out. Key still in the ignition, engine still running. I burst through the gas station front door so loud the clerk went for his gun beneath the counter. Phone. I wheezed, hands on knees, dripping black mud onto the white plastic floors. The clerk studied me, hands still reaching for the gun. Phone! I screamed, my eyes filled with dread. Finally, he understood. 
He went back, grabbed the wired telephone, and handed it to me. I called the park ranger and told her where my brother went missing. She told me a team was en route, told me to stay warm, stay safe. I dropped the phone and wandered back outside. I staggered through the parking lot and climbed back into my brother's jeep. Engine still running, driver's side door still open. I sat there until the rain finally stopped, until the sun finally crept over the western mountains, until the fuel tank emptied and the morning birds started singing. They never found Kai's body. 15 years later, and I still haven't told anyone about the voice from the darkness. Not even my wife. I know that's bad. I know I shouldn't keep secrets, but I'm not ready yet. Maybe in a few years. I keep thinking about Kai's last words. Are you okay? Kai was everything to me, back when we were kids. After mom passed in that car accident, Kai became father, mother, brother, friend, all that in one person. I don't know who that was down in the caves. I don't want to know. It's weird, but sometimes I get the feeling like I'll run into them again. Sometimes I wake up and can't get back to sleep. Sometimes it feels like the stranger from the cave is about to call out any second now. Waiting in the dark, waiting to wrap their cold, wet hands around my ankles and pull me away into nothing. Of course, it never happens, but the thought never goes away. Like any minute now, they'll show up. That small voice calling out from the dark, waiting to pull me into the water. I don't think I'm ready yet. Maybe in a few years. Maybe never. Maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe it'll be far worse than I ever thought. I don't know. Nobody does. But there is one thing I do know. When the day finally comes, when the stranger from the caves finally return, I'll ask if they're okay. Growing up, my brother Roger had always been odd, to say it as kindly as possible. He had a very strange obsession with anything horror, which is fine, but his obsession took him to very unfathomable depths in his head. My parents sought so much therapy for him as a child, even mental hospitals, medications, until one day, as late teenagers, he mellowed out completely. He was what society could deem normal, and this went on until he left home, and my parents could breathe and not fear judgment from their high class peers again. I grew up in a very bougie setting. The finest clothes, the finest schools, the finest foods, you name it. My family had money. They had one well-mannered dream child, which was me. I did everything expected of me. Their daughter who was everything they wanted a little girl to look. And I knew no other way. Then their other child, which I just described, Roger. Poor Roger. I always did pity him. My parents, well, my whole family, did not know how to manage him. He was not a bad child, just different. When all methods had failed to normalize him, they restored to thinking maybe beating the strangeness out of him would work. The beatings were brutal, getting worse with each new obsession he would gain. Broken bones, massive bruises, cuts and lacerations. I remember the blood they split from him. I wept every night, praying to make them stop. All I could ask was why. My father even said to me, if I ever mention a word of them normalizing my brother, they would beat me and send me away. So I maintained reticence out of fear. When we turned 18, my brother vanished. I never knew what happened. That is, until seven years later. I received a message request on Facebook during my lunch break. 
It was from, to my surprise, Roger. Hey sis, it's been so long. How have you been? I invited the whole family over to my place for Thanksgiving. Hope you can join us. Hope you respond. It was a rather short and informal invitation. I assumed he didn't know what to say after a couple of years. Nonetheless, I was overjoyed to hear from him, so I immediately gave him my response. Of course, just tell me the time and place and I'll be there. He instantly responded with, great, then gave me his address while wanting to catch up briefly. I told him I was working as an editor for a magazine and finally got my own penthouse, mostly filling him in on what I've done with my life, more so emphasizing how much I've missed him and worried about him. Oddly enough, I've searched for years, ever since Facebook became a thing. I hoped to find him. He found me. I was so relieved to know he was alright and living comfortably, somewhere that he can be free to express himself without our family cruelly judging him. I had the week of Thanksgiving off, so I decided to make my homemade sweet potato pie to bring to the Thanksgiving dinner. The drive to my brother's house was nerve-wracking. I hadn't seen him in years and I was getting emotional. His home was a small house, one bed and one bath with a large fenced-in backyard. There was a beat-up old pickup truck in his dirt driveway, not in the best conditions, but at least my brother had a place of his own and a job to maintain. I knocked on the door. I was elated when my brother opened the door, but that quickly faded when I saw his physical appearance. His hair was long and disheveled with a beard to match. His clothes faded with a few holes in them. He was barefoot, but what was most shocking of all was the fact that he had cast on both of his forearms. Roger, it's... I couldn't think of the words to say. I was so confused and disheartened by his appearance. He frowned. Well, I may not have the best clothes, but I'm clean and don't stink. What happened to your arms? That's when he gave me a warm smile. You always were the one that cared if I had any injuries. Come in. I followed him inside to the smell of food greeting me. His home was simple with a few pieces of essential furniture. He politely took the pie I was holding to put it in the refrigerator and bid me to sit down on the couch. Where is everyone? I asked him. They'll be here a little later. It's just you and me for right now, he answered. I felt very awkward and out of sorts. Something just seemed off and I couldn't think of why. I guess it is my brother's appearance. He has a home, money for utilities, especially water as I heard the kitchen sink running. And he looked like Tarzan, completely unkept. Had his mental state gotten to the point that he didn't want to take care of himself properly, especially groom himself? Do you need help in the kitchen? I asked. No thanks, I got most of it done. I'm just heating up a few things and cleaning, he answered. So what have you been doing lately? Various jobs, mostly temp stuff. I was working for a construction company for three years, but my hours got cut. Oh, I said, however that story didn't make sense but I refused to call him out on it. I suppose he was too embarrassed to tell me that perhaps he got fired or he got injured, which I assumed was why his arms were bandaged. We chit-chatted for a while, catching up until he told me to come to the table. He had set up the table with a lot of meats, very little vegetables and pies. He placed a bottle of wine next to the turkey while handing me a wine glass. I was very confused at this point. I sat down in my seat while he took the head of the table. Shouldn't we wait until everyone else arrives? I asked. Don't worry about it. 
You should know, they've always been fashionably late for everything. Remember? Roger said as calmly and unnerving as anything I've ever heard him be. Fix yourself a plate. I know you're hungry. Well, shouldn't we say the prayer? Roger brushed me off. Bit hypocritical for our family to pray, don't you think? Makes me question what god our family really worshipped. His tone had hints of anger and malice in it. I know it still bothers you, I began. Bothers me, he laughed. You became the only black sheep. You get slaughtered, not realizing I'm still a sheep of the herd. Only I was a merely tender lamb for the sacrifice, so our family could maintain their high standing among majestic stallions. I just took a sip of my wine, becoming frightened. My sister, you don't realize that however you may be kind, you still had the ability to stop it, but you didn't. Roger, I was just a little child, scared to death, but you still chose silence. He said so menacingly. Not only that, as you got older, you chose the lavishes of our parents, wealth and your school popularity and admiration, that you forgot about me, stopped caring, and kept quiet. I realized now, this was just for him to confront me. I couldn't be angry. He endured a lot of pain, and if this helped him heal, I would let him say whatever he needed to say. He was also right. Though I felt incredibly guilty and ashamed, I never spoke up. You want to know a hard truth? He continued. Something you have no clue of for seven years? I could only remain quiet. He took a deep breath. I was their firstborn. They chose not to put me on their will, as if I never existed. They were that disgusted by me. When I left home, they constantly tormented me. They found me at every shelter I've been in for seven years, sending me horrible letters of how they were ashamed of me, that they'll never help me, and that I was the biggest mistake of their lives. I had various jobs just to survive, and every family member chose to somehow get me fired so I couldn't make any money just so I could have food to eat. I've slept on benches, entryways, parking lots. I remember nights where a member of our family stalked me just to call the cops on me for sleeping where they could find me. But the list goes on. Simply explained, they made it a mission in their lives to make sure I suffer. I was completely mortified and only stared at him in shock. I even had the courtesy to text our loving parents to come to dinner for Thanksgiving. The only reply I got was that I was not their son and for me to rot in hell. But I knew you wouldn't refuse, but I'd make sure they attend dinner, one way or the other. I had no clue what he meant by that last statement. So they're coming? I asked. He looked at me and nodded. Sure are. He gave a grin that sent chills down my spine. Don't give me such a look. Here eat something. I spent days getting this meal just right. I looked at the food in front of me. I started with the turkey. I began carving a piece of the breast when I noticed something strange inside the bird. There were herbs and garlic cloves, but also what appeared to be part of a liver. Did you use the gizzards to stuff the turkey? Among other things, Roger said coolly. My heart was getting stuck in my throat and my guts tightened. Something felt so off and so unsettling. Roger just sat there frighteningly calm, waiting for me to finish making my plate. The gizzards and the turkey were too large for them to come from a 16 pound bird. I set my sight on the rhubarb pie. I cut a slice. As I pulled it up, I noticed a clump of hair and a tooth. I dropped my plate and yelled at Roger. What the hell is happening? What have you done? They got what they deserve, he roared, which made me weak at the knees. They were the monsters. What have you done? I cried. 
I broke into all their houses and brutally beat them the way they had beaten me. I tortured them as they tortured me. They would not stop tormenting me until they were sure I was dead. They stole my childhood and they were stealing my life. Only way I'd ever be free is if they were dead. Do you understand? Why didn't you go to the police and say what? Technically, they have not committed crimes towards an adult. And don't you know that money talks and bullshit walks? A homeless man against rich assholes. But the house. Home invasion. The owner's dead. I was horrified and hysterical. I knew my brother was traumatized, but I didn't know to this extent. Even how our family had pushed him over the edge. They completely destroyed him bringing out the monster from his fantasies. The family is all here. My brother laughed. He pointed to the ham. There's Uncle Terrence, then pointed to the green bean casserole. There's Aunt Hannah. He did this with each dish on the table. But for dear mommy and daddy, they got the specialty. The masterminds behind my failing and unwanted life. I snuck into their million dollar home as they slept in their bed made for a king, tied them up and carried them away here. I beat them, scorched their skin, whipped them with a leather belt till the skin was ripped off, waterboarded them, basically everything they did to me. To insult them even more, I cut the skin off my arms and shoved it down their throats. They were going to accept I was their flesh and blood. Even if they had to literally choke on that fact, they were going to accept me. I was screaming and sobbing hysterically. My legs were shaking and everything didn't feel real. And as for you, dear sister, who chose not to say anything, the one who could have stopped their abuse and put me in a loving home, he said right before he hit me on the head with something and I blacked out. I came to, though my vision was still blurry. I was tied up and my mouth was being held open by some sort of makeshift contraption. I saw my brother sharpening a large cleaver. Since you chose silence, silent you will stay, he said. I screamed as loud as I could when a knock on the door stopped us both. Open up, it's the police. My brother panicked and I tried to run for it, but the front door was knocked down. The police saw me tied up and the outcome for Roger was predictable. An officer came to my rescue while the other two chased Roger. The next couple of weeks was such a whirlwind. I was taken in for questioning and I told them everything. I was told in return that Roger had ended his life before the two officers caught him. Though Roger may have completely lost his mind and he dealt with the pain in his own way, I feel so guilty and responsible for it. If only I had said something sooner. He was different, but he wasn't a monster. Our family made him into one, and my silence only added the fuel. All he had known was pain and hatred. Though it's too late now, I've learned my lesson, and I decided to have an advocate against bullying and abuse of all forms. I will never be afraid or too selfish to speak up again. Last night, I played Among Us with a bunch of college friends. It's a computer game similar to Mafia. You and the other players are on a spaceship, and everyone is either a crewmate or an imposter. The crewmates try to complete tasks they are given and the imposters try to kill everyone. There are some nuances, but that's the gist of it. It was five of us. Me, my roommate Brandon, the girls double across the hall, and David, and a single above us. We were all in our respective bedrooms, alone, in a video call, because if we were actually together, we'd see each other's screens and spoil who was the imposter. Besides, it was the reasonable thing to do with all the COVID spikes recently. Should I start the game? On the screen, five little bipeds ran across the room. 
their faces obscured by cartoon glass. I scanned the name floating over each person. Brandon, Allie, Jenny, David. Go ahead. The screen flashed. Crewmate, there is one imposter among us. Then the game was off. I made my little character run over to fix some wires. About 30 seconds in, I heard Allie's voice. Allie. <gasps> no! I just got killed! Brandon. Hey, no talking about the game. Allie. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Brandon. Then mute yourself. Me. Come on, give her a break. I frowned. Through the speakers, I could hear the faint echo of my voice. As Brandon's microphone picked it up, these dorm walls were so thin. Me. It's her first time playing, Brandon. Come on. Brandon. If everyone says when they die, it gives everything away and ruins the fun. Allie. Okay, okay. I won't say anything. Words flashed across the screen. Dead body reported. Then someone called an emergency meeting and we shrunk our games to see the video call. Allie crossed her arms. I'm so mad, I can't believe. Don't tell us who it is, David said. His face pixelated and a Led Zeppelin poster behind him. I heard a few thumps above me as he shuffled his feet. Listen, I saw Jenny just walk into a room and then walk out. That's telltale imposter behavior. I got lost. I say we vote Jenny off then, I said. She glared at me through the screen. I think it was you. It wasn't me. I was fixing wires. We voted. Jenny got voted off. She was the imposter. Then we started another round. I was again a crewmate. One imposter was among us. I was doing the card scanner task when I heard Allie's voice again, coming through the speaker. Allie, no, 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 get away from me. David, you're not supposed to talk about the game. Come on, you're ruining it for everyone. Allie, no, get away from me. Me, come on, Allie, now we know you're not the imposter. Allie, stop it. Then she finally stopped talking. The line went silent. David. Okay, has anyone found her body yet? Jenny. Nope, not yet. I finally finished my card scanning task, so I walked my character around the spaceship, looking for the engine room. I got lost down a few hallways, but finally found it. I froze. Allie's character, a bright pink astronaut, was just standing there, not dead, just standing still, in the center of the room, as if she were away from the keyboard. Me. Uh, guys, I found Allie. She isn't dead. David. Then what was going on about? Jenny. Is anyone dead yet? Brandon. We can't call a meeting unless we find a body first. An unsettling feeling filled me. I walked around her, in circles. She didn't move. Me. Allie, you still there? Silence. Me. Jenny, is she AFK? Jenny. Shouldn't be. I'll go check though. Shuffling sounds filled the speakers as Jenny got up and left her computer. The rest of us, Brandon, David, and I, waiting in silence. Then sound burst through the speakers. A scream, distorted by static. Jenny. Allie? Oh my god, Allie, can you hear me? Her voice cracked with fear. A sob. And then their soft echoes, from Jenny's microphone in the next room. Me. Jenny, what happened? Jenny. Call the police. I reached for my phone, but as I did, words flashed across the screen. Dead body reported, and above it, the image of Allie's pink character, dead. 
I dialed the police with shaking fingers. What's happening? This is sick. Really fucking sick. I listened to the ring. Then the 911 operator came on. Someone was attacked in my friend's dorm, West Hall. I stopped. All this time, there had been that soft echo of my voice. Brandon's computer picking me up through the thin wall. Now, it was gone. I stood up, shaking. My hand closed around the cold doorknob. I pulled it up, just an inch, and stared out into the common room. The door was creaking open. Behind it, Brandon, holding a knife in one hand and his laptop in the other. I scrambled back into my room, thrust the window open, and began to climb out, but not before my eye caught on my own screen. Dead body reported, with the image of my character. I've been living in this apartment for about a year now and never had a problem. Not until a few weeks ago, this new woman moved into the apartment next to mine. Her name was Celine and she was about my age. She seemed cool. Another young, single professional striking out on her own for the first time. I met her as she was moving in and she came in for a cup of coffee. We exchanged numbers and I thought maybe I would made a new friend. I planned on waiting until she got settled in and then asked if she wanted to go out for dinner or something. And then the noise started. It was about a week after she moved in. Hammering and drilling, going non-stop, day and night. The first day, I put up with it. I mean, we all have to put together furniture and the walls are thin. I figured she'd be done soon and then it would be a non-issue. Then another day passed, and another. Still, the noise continued. Finally, I shot her a text, asking if she needed help setting up her apartment, and very politely asked if she could keep it down a little. She texted me back almost immediately. Sorry about that, I'll keep it down, smiley face. No help needed. Haha, <laughs> should be done soon. And then the noise continued. It kept going for the remainder of that week, until I actually complained to the landlord. In the entire time I've lived in this apartment, this is the only time I've written in a complaint. He assured me it'd be taken care of, but the problem continued. And then the noise stopped. One Tuesday, in the middle of the morning, everything went silent. I sat and waited for the noise to start back up, but it never did. Finally, two weeks of quiet passed. I didn't text Selena again. I decided I wasn't really interested in becoming acquainted with someone who was so inconsiderate of their own neighbors. She didn't reach out to me either, and gradually I put the past annoyance out of my mind. Until about two days ago, that is. I came home from running errands to find police flooding my hallway. I stopped short in surprise, which caught the attention of an officer. Do you live in this building, ma'am? He asked. Uh, yeah. I live in 404, I said, pointing to the door near the epicenter of the swarm. Do you know Selena Michaels? He asked. I know she's my neighbor but I only talked with her once when she moved in. Is everything okay? That was a dumb question. Obviously, everything wasn't okay, but what else do you say in that situation? He ignored my question and instead asked, have you been hearing any strange noises recently? A deep sense of unease was squirming in my gut. There was a lot of noise for a little over a week after she moved in. After that, it settled down though. The officer grimaced. Ma'am, I'd like you to come down to the station with us and give a statement. A statement on what? What's going on? There's been an incident, is all he would say. 
I didn't get any details until I was sitting in an interrogation room with two cops. A file sitting in front of them with a few glossy photos peeking out. That was when they told me that someone had illegally entered Selena's apartment. There was no sign of a break-in, so it must have been someone with access to the apartment. Maybe a boyfriend or someone else who could have stolen her spare key. That was also when they told me she was dead and had been for quite some time, possibly a few weeks. They estimated that the break-in had happened around four weeks ago, just after she moved in. But that's not possible, I said. I heard her working on her apartment at all hours of the day and night. The officers glanced at each other. What you heard wasn't Selena, said one. We have reason to believe that whoever broke in was, during that time, assaulting her and, after she died, dismembering her. I thought back to the noises I heard and the nausea began to rise in my stomach. That's... No. No. That can't be it. She would have screamed. I would have heard her screaming, right? At that moment, my eyes fell back on the file and, before I knew it, I was going to do it. I snatched at the picture that was poking out. One of the officers tried to grab it from my hand, but it was too late. The picture was Selena's head, I presume, although it was impossible to tell it was her. Her eyelids had been cut off and there were pins, dozens of them, at least, sticking into her eyes. The skin on her cheeks had been flayed, her head was severed from the rest of her body, and her mouth had been stitched shut. I think it's time for me to move, but first I'm going to change my phone number. Because just today, I got a text from an unknown number. It read, Sorry about the noise, winky face. <laughs>